I thank you for joining me today. My name is Judith Mendoza. Uh, I will be, I was a little bit um, delayed today, and so instead of starting at 7 p.m. As I, as I had uh, planned to do, instead I am starting uh, now, 8 p.m., so 8 to 9 p.m., and it is continuing uh, the life of Jesus and his ministry. Uh, we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, through Jesus, we are able to know how to get uh, back to having a relationship with God and being accepted under Jesus' sacrifice. And so I thank you for joining me today. My name is Judith Mendoza. I am an ordained minister. I am also um, a Bible teacher. I teach from what the Bible says. And I am also a witness, a witness of God, on the side of God, Jehovah God. Today I will be uh, speaking in the next uh, the next thing that happens in Jesus' life, and this is from the book of Matthew, Matthew uh, chapter 8, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 4. And so if you do have your Bible, I would like uh, for you to go into your own Bible and, and see the information from there. Because God's message is for each and every one of us individually. And so each and every one of us have the responsibility towards God and accountable to God in all matters. But also in the matters that have to do with uh, gaining knowledge. And so if we go into the book of Matthew... And I will begin by using uh, the Good News uh, Bible. And if we go to Matthew chapter 8, it will give us kind of the setting of what was going on. We know that, that Jesus uh, began gaining disciples. He also begins uh, fulfilling prophecy in the way that he is not only doing the preaching activity but he is actually now performing miracles healing humans and this is something that has to do with what will happen in that 1000 year reign that where Jesus will completely have the control over the earth and that means over us humans who want to be under his submission under his kinship and leadership and of course that is what we want to learn how these things are going to be what will happen after that day of judgment from god through jesus which is soon approaching and so we want to know these things uh, so that we ourselves can make the decision of what we want to do with our lives. Because basically, uh, we have free will. So we have the choice. But God does not want anyone to be destroyed. So we have to keep that in mind. That uh, Jehovah God does not desire anyone to be destroyed. So... Today is going to be concentrating in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Matthew, if you go to the uh, book of Matthew, Matthew was the tax collector. That was his secular work. And if you go to the book of Matthew and you find chapter 8, uh, the bigger numbers are the chapters. And then it is divided with uh, verses, which are the smaller numbers. Um, now, on Chapter 8, starting from verse 14, he says, 
that Jesus heals many people. That, that is the title that is found in this Bible. And he says, Jesus went to Peter's home, and there he saw Peter's mother-in-law sick in bed with a fever. He touched her, he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. And it continues, when evening came, people brought to Jesus many who had demons in them. Jesus drove out the evil spirits with a sword and with a word, not a sword, whether with a word, and heal all who were sick. He did this to make come true what the prophet Isaiah has said. He himself took our sickness and carry away our diseases. So imagine this prophecy come to life right there for those people who have been waiting for this awaited Messiah. It is thrilling for them because, of course, first of all, they did not know who will be the Messiah, how it will happen, but we see that God is developing what his purpose will ultimately be. And so we have here Jesus fulfilling prophecy and doing works that people are recognizing are a fulfillment of God's word. In this way, Jesus becomes the truth because he makes God's word uh, become a reality. And so for our future, when we compare this that happened to the Israelites, which were uh, considered a nation whose God was Jehovah God, and according to Jesus, he is the only true God, according to what he says in John 17, 3, we can expect greater things in the future. Uh, of course, all of us who have sicknesses, who are uh, suffering from different sicknesses, we want to be cured from these. And ultimately, Jesus will do this in a great scale after that day of judgment. It will be uh, based on what we choose to do. And Another, there's a, a thing to notice over here, but I will mention it a little bit later, if you notice, but what I want you to notice is that Peter had a mother-in-law. So what does that mean? Peter was married. That's what that means. So what, what some teach in regards to getting married? Some teach that getting married is something that, that was not done. And I don't know where that come from, but we know that Jesus came over here with a mission to the earth to fulfill God's word and to come to bring about God's purpose. He did not get married because that's the reason why he was born. That is what he said. So yes, he was a human, but he was a human with a mission, a mission to save all of us from death and sin and undo what had been caused by Adam and Eve, especially by Adam because he had the uh, leadership role. He took the lead. And so basically then if you're taking the lead, then if you lead, then the, most of the responsibility will come upon the one who leads. And so in this situation was Adam. But Jesus came to undo the works of the devil and to undo that what was caused by Adam and his decisions. So he wasn't thinking about coming to the earth, getting married, settle down, and have kids, and you know, just like we do, we humans do, that was not his purpose. 
that's not the reason why God sent them into the world. And so, what about the rest? What about the disciples? Well, the disciples were humans, and they were having a regular life, living their lives, and then uh, it is uh, announced through John that Jesus is the Messiah, that John is preparing the way for this Messiah to arrive, and through this Messiah, all these things that God has promised will be fulfilled. And so, yes, they, the regular life, including that they were married, the Bible does not teach that men shouldn't get married. I will consider a little bit more about that. Uh, but continuing, if we go to the book of Mark, this is another writer of the gospel or good news that write in regards to Jesus life and so Mark chapter 1 if you go to the book of Mark and you look at Mark chapter 1 verse verses 21 through 34 and so this is what Mark says he says Jesus and his disciples came to the town of Capernaum and on the next Sabbath Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people who heard him were amazed at the way he taught for he wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead he taught with authority. And up to 34. On 25 it says, Jesus ordered the spirit be quiet and come out of the man. The evil spirit shook, shook. The evil spirit shook the man hard, gave a loud scream and came out, out of him. The people were all so amazed that they started saying to one another, What is this? Is it some kind of new teaching? This man has authority to give orders to the evil spirits and they obey him. And so the news about Jesus spread quickly everywhere in the province of Galilee. Now on 29 says, Jesus and his disciples, including James and John, left the synagogue and went straight to the home of Simon in Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a fever and as soon as Jesus arrived he was told about her. He went to her, took her by the hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. After the sun had set and evening had come people brought to him to Jesus all the sick and those who had demons. All the people of the town gathered in front of the house. Jesus healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases and drove out many demons. He will not let the demons say anything because they knew who he was. And then uh, if you go to the book of Luke we are going to read according to Luke in chapter 4. If you find chapter 4, and beginning on verse 31, says this. Luke 4, 31 says this. Then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, where he taught the people on the Sabbath. They were all amazed at the way he taught, because he spoke with authority. In the synagogue was a man who had the spirit of an evil demon in him. He screamed out in a loud voice, Ah! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you here to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy messenger. 
Jesus ordered the spirit, be quiet, and come out of the man. The demon threw the man down in front of them and went out of him without doing any harm. The people were all amazed and said to one another, What kind of words are these? With authority and power, this man gives order, orders to the spirit, to the evil spirits, and they come out. And the report about Jesus spread everywhere in that region. So this is another thing to note. Now, this is not speaking. If we, if this is not speaking, let me finish my thought because I want to say many things <laughs> at the same time. So, if we notice, this is speaking about the demons. So, it's not only Satan who was going up and coming back down to the earth. It was also the demons. In the beginning with Adam and Eve, it's not mentioned others except for Satan. Uh, the devil who used the snake but later on in the accounts in the Bible we know that there were also others with Satan and that means that they were also rebelling against God and basically doing what Satan had been doing rebelling against God. They have free will. Uh, spirit creatures have free will. And so just as us humans have free will and we can have the potential to imitate Jehovah God, to imitate God and do what is good. We have the potential to do what is good. We have a conscience that God has given us so that we can, we can direct ourselves into what we want to do. The spirit creatures also have uh, been taught by God, but just as any son or daughter who decides to disobey their parents and rebel, even though the parents have give, given that child uh, the correct education and everything that a father and a mother can give to a son and daughter to prepare them for for their way in life but yet that man or woman later on as an adult decide to rebel or as a teenager decide to rebel against uh, their parents they do this because they have free will and the same is with those spirit creatures they do have free will they do have knowledge we have uh, seen uh, satan using and twisting the scriptures we know that that in uh the, out of the three temptations that jesus went through that satan put him through uh, one of those uh times or two of those times satan used what is written in the Bible. So, Satan knows what God wants, but he decides that he's going to rebel. Well, according to what we just read, the demons are doing the same thing. But if you notice also, as we have noticed also with the traits in Satan, they like to use violence and abuse and harm if you notice over here what it says in Luke it, is, it gives us a better detail in regards to this he even tell us over here in 33 that in the synagogue was a man who had the spirit of an evil demon in him he screamed out in a loud voice. Ah, what do you want with us? Said 
the demons to Jesus. They know him by name. They know Jesus by name. And the demon is speaking for the human also. Taking control of this human. He has taken control of the human. He says, in the synagogue was a man who had the spirit of an evil demon in him. He screamed out in a loud voice. And then he said, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you here to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy messenger. And the other one had mentioned uh, in Matthew chapter 8, when we compare the two accounts, Matthew chapter 8, I'll find it, Matthew chapter 8, 14. Through 17. Oh no, that one tells us about Peter. So let's see Mark. Mark. Mark chapter 1. Because I want to make a comparison of what is being said about this evil demon. And Mark chapter 1. 21 through 34 yes in here on 23 it says uh, Mark chapter 1 23 says just then a man with an evil spirit came into the synagogue and screamed see the other account says that he was already in the synagogue inside the synagogue in here it tells us that the man was coming into the synagogue and screamed, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you here to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy messenger. So that is what Mark says over here also. And so when we look at these, right, when we look at these scriptures, We see that. We see um, the, the way that Satan is the personality of Satan and the personality of these demons. And then in contrast, when we compare with Jehovah God, with Jesus, and with the angels, we know the difference. We can see the difference there. We can, we can readily acknowledge that Satan and the demons are against God, are enemies of God, enemies of Jesus, enemies of the angels, and are against anything that God stands for. Therefore, we humans, have the potential to imitate Jehovah God and his personality which is greatly seen in everything that he has created but also in his word the Bible and in the love that he has for us humans but then in contrast we have also the personality of Satan and the demons we can see anger we can see violence, selfishness, envy, and, from, and hate. If we note, these uh, demons, up to that time, up to that time, the demons had who will do these things? Take possession of people, 
and 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 basically take over the the person's body. And why did they did do this? Well, we know that in the time of in the time of Noah, there were some angels that came down to the earth and transformed themselves or make themselves human bodies and so that they could get married to the women from the earth and then they had children with them and they were hybrids uh, mixed uh, with angels and humans and these uh, were according to what the record of the Bible says these were violent humans these were violent humans and caused much trouble for others that were living at that time and basically it was all that violence that God had mentioned that was part of the earth being destroyed and basically uh, that's what violence brings if you think about it there, there's no advancement where there is this uh, violence and, and, and abuse uh, basically a person will just waste their time doing this and, and there's no success there's no advancement of anything at all uh, nothing can be done because of these things so now going back to to what I read right because it, um, it this in regards to the demons they cause much suffering to the person the person basically lost total control of self and the demons were in possession of the human and the reason why they did this i forgot i was going to say that um the reason why they did this is because after the flood in noah's time that um got, that rid all of those who were violent uh also is mentioned in the book of Jude that these demons that did this at that time were basically put in jail and they are there waiting for judgment time and the ability the ability to to make bodies in the way that they were making bodies in the time of Noah the Bible shows that that ability was taken off so instead of them doing that anymore transforming themselves into humans uh, making themselves human bodies for them to, to to do their deeds their bad deeds instead they started taking possession of humans and this is what basically is going on in the time of Jesus where uh, it is mentioned over here by Mark and Luke and let me go back to it again Luke chapter 4 verse 31 through 41 In Luke he said, now in the synagogue there was a man with a spirit, an unclean demon, and he shouted with a loud voice, Ah, what have we to do with you, Jesus the Nazarene? Did you come to destroy us? I know exactly who you are, the Holy One of God. And we know that the word messenger, which is mentioned in the other translation of the Bible, the good news is messenger means angel. For angel means messenger. And so in here it's mentioned 
uh, the Holy One of God. And so Jesus puts a stop to it. But Jesus, he says, but Jesus rebuked it saying, be silent and come out of him. So why did Jesus do this? Jesus um, ordered order this demon to come out of the man and he did. That show us that Jesus has way more authority than other angels and also over these demons. Because it says so after throwing the men down in their midst, this is the violent part. Because the demon didn't just come out of the man. The demon actually threw the man down in the midst of them. And say, and he says, so after throwing the man down in their midst, the demon came out, came out of him without hurting him. At this, they were all astonished and began to say to one another, what kind of speech is this? Because here's these men that they have known as the carpenter doing these things, having authority over these demons and commanding this to leave this man alone. And then also to tell them to be quiet. And why? Well, Jesus will tell them to be quiet and not to speak anymore about him or about anything because they, Jesus did not want to make it be or, or allow the situation for the demons to make it look like the demons have some connection with Jesus. Because we know that that's one tactic that Satan uses. We know that he used the tactic when he was, when he was trying to convince uh, Jesus to uh, do uh, an act, an action of obeisance to to Jesus, um, to Satan. Satan was asking Jesus to make an action of obeisance, of worship. To, to him, to, to Satan. Satan wanted that. And Satan said, I will give you all these things. Which means that the power of kingdoms and rulerships and governments that he was controlling and manipulating since the beginning of, of humanity through Adam and Eve. So, There, at that moment, the Satan said, it has been given me. As if God was having some type of communication uh, with Satan in while, while Jesus was on the earth. That's exactly what he was trying to make it look like. Like, you know, uh, God, Jehovah God and I, we got it going on now that you're here on the earth. And you can be, you can be transforming back into the archangel that you were in heaven. Because Jesus is known as Michael, the archangel. And Jesus is a title of responsibility, meaning Jehovah is salvation. So Satan knew that maybe, maybe, just maybe, that would have planted some type of doubt in in Jesus saying that that it has been given me as if God has given him something because who else is going to give him that power that he he wanted so bad and obviously he didn't get it he didn't get the power that he wanted because of the way that he was eventually leading him to his own destruction by Jesus himself later on after uh, 
after the uh, day of judgment. And so that has been already pre-planned pre and it is in God's purpose for that to happen, for Satan to be destroyed by Jesus. This occasion uh, tells us how these demons were doing this. But we know that now the demons do not have the power to overtake humans in this manner. So what do the demons do then? Well, they cannot transform into humans. They cannot make bodies for themselves anymore, human bodies. They cannot overtake humans anymore, as they did possess humans. They can't do that no more. So what do they do? Well, we can be manipulated. He can uh, use our own weaknesses and go from there. And basically that's what happens. That's what has happened. Satan has, uh, if we allow it, because we have control of ourselves, and God is greater than anyone, and anything that we ask God, that of course is according to his will, he listens to us. And every prayer that we do through his son Jesus, everything, um, that is according to God's will we want to become uh, imitators of God that is according to God's will so he listens to us and we will not be overpowered by Satan tactics that he uses now the other thing that I and in regards to these demons and demon possession uh, later on, I will uh, explain a little bit further in regards to in regards to it, so that we can have a better understanding of what um, these evil spirit creatures are and how uh, they what happens with them and how they can manipulate and control us, but also how we can stand against the devil. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention is in regards to in regards to what is mentioned about Peter. And it is mentioned there that his mother-in-law, so that means that the man was married. The teaching is um, and let me see if I find the word. The teaching is, which is not a biblical teaching, that that a person, a man, in order for a man to serve God in certain denominations, the man should be in the state of abstaining from marriage and sexual relations. That is not only something that goes against God when what God has uh, created, which we know that God created the man, the male, and then he created the woman, a female, and he blessed their union, meaning he married them. And basically he told them to multiply and that he, he gave the command, even though Adam and Eve didn't have human parents, right? Adam and Eve had as their father, Jehovah God. 
who had created them. And so, he's the one who instituted the marriage arrangement between a male man and a female woman. Let me, uh, a celibacy, right? State of abstaining from marriage and sexual relations, which is thought as some kind of requirement in order to measure up to some type of religious institution is not biblical. They usually mention Peter, and Peter was married. And so I am going to look for some information over here, but in, in the meantime, let me tell you who Peter was. Peter, we know that Jesus had gone to Judea, to the river, Jordan River. He had got bat, gotten baptized in there by John. Then he went to the desert for 40 days, was tempted by Satan. Then he returned to John, and from there he started gaining disciples. His disciples walked along with him all the way back to his hometown in Galilee, Nazareth. And when they arrived there, they went back to their to doing their own things that they were doing their secular work. But then we know that uh, Jesus acquired uh, these four disciples that he wanted full time to follow him full time. And so one of them uh, was Peter. And Peter is mentioned over here as his uh, mother-in-law being sick and Jesus healing her. The fever just left her. He mentions there. And we know the type of illness that she may have had or we can guess because uh, we know that a fever, uh, what causes the fever is uh, some type of, of anything in the body that may cause the body to react and uh, the first thing that we know that we are sick that something is not good with us is fever and we know that word because Luke was a physician and then there um, he, he used to deal with those situations so Peter who was Peter well Peter uh, was an apostle of the Christ of Jesus Christ and he's named in five different ways in the scriptures uh, by the Hebrew, Hebrew Simeon, the Greek Simon, Peter, um, and also its Semitic equivalent of Cephas. And then the combination of Simon Peter, which uh, is, um, is also mentioned in the Bible. Peter was the son of an uh, of a man named John or Jonah. So the name John could have come from the name of Jonah. Peter is uh, first shown residing in Bethsaida, but later in Capernaum, and then also these both places are located on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. Peter and his brother Andrew were engaged in the fishing business, evidently associated with James and John, which these are the four apostles that start following Jesus full time. And he start training them in the ministry. This ministry, which later on will become known as what we know now, Jehovah's Witnesses, which are the only ones who are doing the witnessing work or activity as, he, as Jesus did. We're the only ones. So, he mentions also that Peter is shown to be a married man. And at least in later years, his wife apparently accompanied him on his missions, or some of them. 
as did the wives of others of the apostles. His mother-in-law lived in his womb, one he shared with his brother Andrew. And this is what Mark shows, right? Because they are coming in into Peter's home and there's his mother-in-law that is sick. So that, that is what the account of Mark shows us. Mark chapter 1 verses 29 through 31. So in regards to the ministry with Jesus, Peter was one of the earliest of the Jesus of Jesus' disciples, uh, being led to Jesus by Andrew, a disciple of John the Baptizer. So we see the connection, right? When John begins the preaching and teaching activity, and what else can we say? Peter displayed rock-like qualities. He was a strong man. And especially after Jesus' death and resurrection, becoming a strengthening influence on his fellow Christians. And so we know that Jesus did say in regards to Peter, Peter, you will deny me. You will deny knowing me. Three times before the rooster uh, sings. And so, it did happen that way. But even, even in a time that we can say, well, you know, Peter did deny uh, being with Jesus, knowing Jesus three times, just as how Jesus had mentioned. Peter was the only one that stayed with Jesus. Even though he denied him, but he followed him. He knew where they took him. And basically, uh, his life was at stake because of that. All the other apostles left after Jesus got arrested. But Peter followed. And so, even though... Uh, Jesus told him, you will deny me because, you know, it will happen out of fear. But then we also know that he was, he had much courage for him to actually follow Jesus and, and knowing and seeing what was going on with him. And so basically that's a little bit about Peter. Now, in regards to, let me see, in regards to the word celibacy, celibacy, is celibacy a requirement for Christian ministers? That is the question. So, what can we know about this? We know that different denominations do require this as a requirement to become uh, priests. For example, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, the various Orthodox churches, Buddhism, and others require of their religious leaders and clergy to be having this uh, celibacy. On the other hand, many people feel that this practice lies at the root of the recent wave of sexual scandals involving clerics of various religions. Basically, people believe, well, you know, you're holding back your sexual desires, but not really holding them back, you're uh, committing depraved sexual actions uh, because basically people are saying, well, you know, you're, you're being withheld from being married and having uh, your sexual desires being fulfilled in the marriage arrangement. So it is therefore reasonable to ask if celibacy is a scriptural requirement for Christian ministers. 
And to answer that question, we can consider celibacy in religious history. The Encyclopedia Britannica describes celibacy as the state of being unmarried and therefore sexually abstinent, usually in association with the role of a religious official or devotee. In a 2006 address to the Roman Curia, then Pope Benedict XVI, linked compulsory celibacy to a tradition that dictates back to an epoch close to that of the apostles. Celibacy, however, was not a religious custom practiced by the first century Christians. As we know, Peter was married. In fact, the Apostle Paul also was, uh, wa uh, he warned, he said, uh, Paul, who lived in the first century, warned believers about men who would not make misleading, inspired statements and forbid marriage. So this happened back then in the first century. What's going on? First and second century and third century. And then later on, it became what it is known now. And so, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 tells us, the Apostle Paul says, however, the inspired word clearly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to misleading, inspired statements and teachings of demons by means of the hypocrisy of men who speak lies, whose conscience is seared, as with a branding iron, they forbid marriage and command people to abstain from foods that God created to be partaken of with thanksgiving by those who have faith and accurately know the truth. So what is that describing? Did the Apostle Paul knew that there will be certain denominations that will do this? Yes. He did, by inspiration. God inspired him to say this. Because it will happen, and we know that it did. And we are attesting to it being it. And so, it's unscriptural. It was during the second century that the practice of celibacy began to make its way into the Western Christian churches, according to the book celibacy and religious traditions. This was consistent with the new wave of sexual restraint that arose in the Roman Empire. In the following centuries, church councils and so-called church fathers promoter, promoted clerical celibacy. They taught that sexual intercourse was defiling and incompatible with clerical duties. Nevertheless, the Encyclopedia Britannica points out that as late as the 10th century, many priests and even some bishops had wives, which is, is unscriptural. Marriage comes from God, not from humans. God is the one who makes this arrangement between these two people, two, two humans, Adam the male man and Eve, which the Bible says he created them, male and female. God's view of celibacy. God's view of celibacy is clearly expressed in his word, the Bible. In it, we read Jesus' words about those who remain single as he did on account of the kingdom of the heavens. That's a different thing. If I choose to remain for some time single, I choose to remain single, meaning single, and also without having sexual relations because that will be fornication and it will be hypocrisy for me to be telling others not to do something when I am doing something that is inappropriate, unacceptable to God. And so, it mentions over here in Matthew 19.12, it says, 
for there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs on account of the kingdom of the heavens. Let the one who can make room for it, make room for it. And this is what later on, the Apostle Paul later explained further in regards to, um, in regards to, to singleness, which is a gift. Marriage is also, being married is a gift, but also singleness is a gift. And so the Apostle Paul spoke about Christians who chose to follow his example of singleness for the sake of the good news. Because, of course, uh, a, the person who is single, who is unmarried, who chooses to stay in this state, can use his or her life to more fully to expand in the preaching and teaching activities because he or she do not have the responsibility to tend to their mate. However, neither Jesus nor Paul were commanding ministers to be celibate. Jesus stated that singleness was a gift not possessed by all by all his followers. When Paul wrote about those who had never married, he frankly admitted, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my opinion. It was Paul's opinion because marriage was God's arrangement, but we have free will. We can choose to stay married. It is not, it is, it, there is no, no scripture in the Bible that says that we must get married. And some feel, because they feel pressured by their family members, by their friends, um, especially if there's a group of friends and they're getting married and you're maybe the only one who's now single and unmarried and feel maybe pressured by the pressure of of the social friendships that surround us and, and, and make make the one person feel well you know um, I need to get married and feel pressure into getting married just because of that so um, but again if we are uh, not concentrating in that then uh, if, if we think in in the way of of singleness being a gift marriage is a gift but singleness being a gift and making the most of it because we have uh, the responsibility for ourselves we don't have the responsibility shared responsibility with another human then we can do more in 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 a lot of the areas of life. In addition, the Bible shows that many Christian ministers in the first century, including the Apostle Peter, were married, as I mentioned. In fact, on account of the prevalence of immoral sexual practices in the Roman world of that time, Paul wrote that if a Christian overseer was married, he was to be a husband of one wife and have his children in subjection. Of course, they had to be given these uh, commands because people adapt and adopt uh, different things and, and little by little they allow themselves to, to approving of things that God does not approve of. And so the Apostle Paul had to remind them to be the husband of one wife and to have uh, the children under their subjection. These were not salivate marriages for the Bible candidly states that a husband ought to give to his wife her due. So they were not just married 
and then not have sexual interactions, which is one of the things that husbands and wives do together. There are many other things that husbands and wives do together, but he mentions over here, the Bible candidly mentions that the husband ought to give his wife her due. And the wife should give her husband his due also. So it's not just, you know, just one person gets, it's both persons get to enjoy the action of having sexual intercourse in their married relationship. And, of course, married couples should not deprive each other of sexual intimacies. And this is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5, which says, Let the husband give to his wife her due, and let the wife also do likewise to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but her husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have the authority over his own body, but his wife does. They belong to each other. And he says on 5, Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent for an appointed time, so that you may devote time to prayer and may come together again in order that Satan may not keep tempting you for your lack of self-control. So, basically, it is something that is, um, that was to be part. We know that God said to Adam and Eve to multiply, which meant, obviously, have sex. And it was part of what husbands and wives do in their married relationship. Of course, if, it's, if the two were not married, and we know that one who has considered marriage has considered something uh, for a very long time. Actually, the vow said, until death do us apart. So, it is, being uh, married, it is something that is um, a big responsibility, a joyous responsibility. There's joy in it. But we humans can make life difficult for ourselves, and if we don't take uh, the, the, the correct decisions when it comes to uh, marriage, of course. And so that was it for today. Uh, we know that Jesus will continue in his ministry and he will be expanding his ministry in Galilee. We know that he went to, um, to, to the temple, but then he had to leave from there, went to Capernaum. That's where all of this happened. And then now he's going to go back to in the area of Galilee so that he can continue expanding with his um, his ministry along with his disciples and we will see what will happen next and that will be next Wednesday and I am sure that I will be keeping the time to to this time from 8 to 9 most likely from 8 15 to 9 15 but that will be for next week. And so I thank you for joining me today. And I hope you continue to have a beautiful Wednesday. Bye-bye.